I will move to question time and I call Senator Cash. Uh, thank you very much. And my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Workplace Relations, Senator Watt. Minister, in the more than 700 pages of the Closing the Loopholes Bill and Explanatory Memorandum introduced into Parliament yesterday, can you identify one measure that will improve productivity in Australian businesses? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Senator Cash. Uh, order. <coughs> order. Order. Uh, Senator Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Henderson, can we just have a question time where you don't constantly interject? I'm calling you to order. Order on my right. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Uh, I think that's a record even for Senator Henderson. I hadn't even opened my mouth and apparently I was a disgrace. Um, well, it didn't take it didn't take Senator Cash and the opposition long to do Order. what they love doing most, which is uh, keep Minister, workers' wages low. Senator, resume your seat. Uh, thank you. Senator Wong. Order. Order. Uh, Minister Watt, please continue. Is that her actual response? Mm. Mm. Um, as I say, President, it didn't take the opposition very long to revert to type, to revert to their happiest place, which is keeping wages low and keeping productivity low. Because, of course— uh, Minister Watt, please resume your seat. I'm waiting for order. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. They don't like being reminded that I am smiling because I'm smiling because we have a government now that is actually committed to getting wages moving again. Uh, and you Minister know what? Watt, That's a good thing. Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Order on my left. Minister Watt. I think it says a lot about the opposition that rather than smiling about workers' wages going up, they frown, they scowl, they yell. Uh, because Minister this is the Watt, one thing please that... resume your seat. Order. This is disrespectful of the Senate. I've had to constantly call order. And we're two minutes in. Minister Watt. Yeah, so I, I, I am smiling about the fact that we've got wages moving again. I am smiling about the fact that already this government's workplace relations Minister reforms. Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Henderson, I named you at the beginning of question time, and you have just continued to disregard my request that you refrain from constant interjections. Minister Watt. Um, so, yeah, I am in my happy place, and I think the Labor Party is in our happy place when we're actually getting wages moving again. Order. And it turns out that's what the Order. people of Australia wanted. Uh, and, in fact, already, due to the reforms uh, Minister that Watt, we... Please resume your seat. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. And it's in relation to relevance, uh, the question... Moment. Senator Cash, please resume your seat. Calling for order also applies to the right-hand side of the chamber. I have a senator on her feet raising a point of order. She's entitled to be heard in silence. Minister Cash, please. Point of order in senator relation Cash, to please. direct relevance. Uh, the question was very specific. I asked the minister to identify one measure in the bill that will improve productivity in Australian businesses. Uh, thank you, Minister. Thank you, Senator Cash. Order. I haven't called you, Minister Watt. Order. Order. There has been so much disorder since you asked your question. I think it's been very hard for the minister to actually get to the substance. I will remind him of your question. But I would also ask that senators on both sides of the chamber listen in silence. Minister Watt. Um, so, Senator Cash, I don't have to only refer to one measure in this bill that will lift productivity. The entire package is going to lift productivity in the workplace because something that, something that eluded the opposition for the 10 years they were in office was that uh, cooperative Minister workplaces Watt? are productive workplaces. Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Order again. Minister, please continue. As I say, cooperative, safe workplaces are productive uh, workplaces. Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Cash, I have just called the chamber to order, and the minute the minister was on his feet, you continued to interject. Minister Watt. Uh, but I am I'm happy that at last, after 10 years of government, 
it took returning to opposition for the opposition to actually care about productivity because their uncooperative, conflict-based workplace relations system delivered the lowest Order, decade Senator of McGrath. productivity growth that we have had in 60 years. That's what your program, Workplace Relations, did. Low productivity, low wages, and we're turning that around. All right, thank you. Senator Cash. Senator Order across the chamber. Senator Cash, first supplement. Uh, thank you. And, Minister, in the more than 700 pages of the Closing the Loopholes Bill, can you identify one measure that will make it easier for Australian businesses to employ more workers? Thank you. Senator Cash, Minister what? Because, in fact, there's actually, there are actually provisions within this bill that seek to treat workers who have been mistreated for the last 10 years under the opposition to be, receive employee-like conditions. Uh, I understand that your life's mission is to keep workers' wages low. I understand that your, your economic policy Order. was to deliberately keep wages low. Uh, Australians Watt. voted against that Minister and they Watt. kicked you Order again. Minister Watt, please continue. If at some point you've got to recognise that the party that had a low wages policy lost the last election. The people of Australia didn't want your 10 years of low wage growth, low productivity, conflict-baked workplaces. They voted for cooperative workplaces that were going to lift wages, and we're already doing it. Even in the time we've been in power, we've had the Order. strongest jobs growth for the first Senator year of McGrath. any Australian government. We've created half a million jobs, 85 per cent full-time, and wages are growing at their fastest rate for a decade, and we're only getting started. Uh, thank you, Minister. Senator Cash, second supplementary. Uh, thank you, Minister. How much extra in costs will the bill add to Australian businesses? And how much of that do you expect them to pass on to consumers? Thank you, Senator Cash. Minister Watt. It's good to have the scare campaign from Senator Cash rolling out again, because remember, remember what she said about the last package of workplace relations reform? Uh, the Minister last package... Watt, please resume your seat. Order. Minister Watt, please continue. The last time we did industrial relations reform in this chamber, what did Senator Cash say? It was going to take us back to the dark ages. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not seeing anyone run around there in chain mail, in body uh, armour, out Watt? there like the dark ages. I'm Minister seeing workers Watt. getting paid what Minister they deserve. Watt, please resume your seat. Order. Uh, Senator Wong, order. Senator Rustin, order. Senator Cash. Uh, again, it is a point of order in relation to direct relevance. The question was in relation to how much this bill will raise costs uh, on businesses and in relation to those costs by how much the government expects them to go on to consumers. It was a very specific yes, thank question. Thank you, uh, Senator Cash. I will remind the minister of your question. Minister Watt. Let's put all this in context. As a percentage of the total wages budget of Australia, these changes will add one-tenth of one per cent of what wages are in Australia. And unlike what the opposition is saying, this is not a cost to the economy. This Order. is a cost Order. to the small number of businesses that are underpaying their workers by exploiting the loopholes that the last opposition, last government left. Order. This money won't be taken out of the economy. It will go into workers' pockets where it belongs so that they can actually deal with cost of living pressures, pay their bills and get back up on their feet. Workers currently being underpaid will have more money Thank to spend you, in their local the communities and we support has that. Expired. Senator Walsh. Thank you very much, President. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Gallagher. Tomorrow, the ABS will release the national accounts for the June quarter, providing the most up-to-date snapshot of how the Australian economy is performing and how Australian households and businesses are responding to current conditions. Can the Minister please update the Senate on the challenges facing our economy? and how the Albanese government's economic plan is working to ensure Australians are provided with targeted and carefully calibrated cost of living relief investments, and how important it is to support economic growth now and into the future and to repair the budget over time. 
Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much, President, and I thank Senator Walsh uh, Senator for the Hughes. question and for her uh, leadership of the uh, Senate Economics Committee. It's good to get a, a question on the economy. Yes. Uh, the government's highest priority is, of course, as uh, rolling out billions of dollars in cost of living relief. Uh, Minister Peter, you in your seat. Order, Senator McKenzie. Order, Minister Gallagher. Please continue. Uh, thank you. Um, rolling out billions of dollars in cost of living relief in ways that take pressure off inflation um, and support the economy. Now, tomorrow's national accounts, and uh, today during question time, of course, we'll have the Reserve Bank uh, decision. But tomorrow's national accounts um, will be released tomorrow, and we will expect to get an assessment of the impacts of the increases in interest rates the high but moderating inflation and some of the continuing global uncertainty and the impact that's having on the economy. And we are seeing welcome progress in the fight against inflation. Uh, higher interest rates that started increasing in May uh, last year before the election have impacted, particularly on mortgaged households, and uh, are slowing the economy. National accounts are likely to show the combined impact of these high interest rates or the higher interest rates and that global uncertainty. And we understand that Australians are doing it tough, which is why our focus, our main priority uh, focus, has been on providing targeted cost of living relief in a way that doesn't add to inflation and in a way that the budget can afford. Now, that pack, uh, cost of living package includes providing assistance across the board uh, in, in support for those who uh, receive rent assistance, uh, for those who are using the childcare, early education and care system, for those that are accessing cheaper medicines or needing uh, scripts filled every month or every two months under some of the changes recently, the fee-free TAFE, which has been such an incredible success, and, of course, uh, support uh, to reduce the impact of energy increases on through energy bills. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator Walsh, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, Minister. How important is it that the government balances the challenges facing the economy, both here and globally, while at the same time working to strengthen the economy and support Australian households, particularly those that are doing it tough? How will the government's targeted cost of living relief measures support households and the economy in the coming months? Thank you, Senator Walsh. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. I thank Senator Walsh uh, for the supplementary. And we've seen uh, in recent economic data that Australians are pull pulling back on their spending, dipping into their savings, and we will see a lot of those cost of living relief measures flow into the economy over the next uh, few months, uh, some of them that started on the 1st of July, but some of those important supports around income support that have started in September. And I would say in the uh, inflation data for July, it was very instructive. The ABS uh, showed uh, very clearly the impact that our energy rebates are having on energy bills uh, for people in, in contributing to CPI. If, if, if we exclude the impact of rebates from the July 23 figures, electricity prices would have been recorded a monthly increase of 19.2 per cent as opposed to 6 per cent. Now, let's remember who voted against those rebates? Who voted against those rebates? All of those over here. That's right, all of them that voted to keep electricity bills higher than they needed to be. Uh, Senator Walsh, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Thank you, Minister. The final budget outcome will be published at the end of this month, and for the first time in 15 years, the government will deliver a budget surplus. Why is the, government, why is the government's fiscal strategy so important when it comes to supporting the economy Order. going forward? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you very much, President. I thank Senator Walsh for that question. Well, we have flagged, and through the budget, we uh, indicated that we did, were expecting a surplus for the 22-23 year. It will come in significant significantly higher than was forecast uh, at this year's budget, and we will be the first government in 15 years to del actually deliver a yeah, budget yeah. surplus, yeah, not yeah, promise yeah. one, yeah, yeah. not get mugs printed, not run around saying how great you are that you Order. expect to deliver one, but actually deliver a budget surplus, reduce the amount of debt Order. that we have to borrow, Order. reduce interest payments for a generation over Gallagher. time because of our fiscal Minister. management. Order. Order. 
Minister, please continue. I know they hate it, uh, President, but we've returned 87 per cent of tax receipt upgrades to the budget. We found $40 billion of savings across two budgets. How many did you Senator find? Hume. How many? Zero. Zero. Zero savings from those opposite. And these careful steps have meant that we will deliver a strong budget surplus for the 22-23 year. Minister, Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Yesterday, the Western Australian Labor Premier, Roger Cook, added his voice to the chorus of state Labor leaders who questioned this government's decision to block Qatar Airways from providing more services to Perth and to Western Australians. He said, and I quote, at the moment, we're particularly disadvantaged by the lack of competition in our domestic aviation market and the protections that Qantas enjoy as our so-called national carrier. Qatar Airways kept running during COVID, bringing home Western Australians and keeping our freight moving. My government has been clear that we want more routes connecting Perth and the cultural and economic benefits that those flights bring. Minister, why have some of your Labor colleagues seen the light and why is the Prime Minister and his government burying its head in the sand when it comes to this decision? Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Minister Wong. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, President. Uh, uh, and uh, the point I would make is that under the arrangements that there are in place, Qatar Airways can add more seats into Australia today, uh, and they are welcome to do so. Order. Uh, and that we support sustainable. Order. Order. Order on my left. I should not have to call order repeatedly. It's disrespectful. Minister, please continue. Uh, and we support sustainable growth of Australia's aviation sector. Now, right now, uh, as uh, the senator would know, Qatar Airlines, Airlines Airways can fly as many planes as they like into Adelaide, Avalon, Cairns, Canberra, and Gold Coast. They can. Order. I'm coming to Perth. Uh, minister, just, everybody, minister Wong. Everybody, yes. Uh, minister Wong, please I'm coming to seat. Perth. Minister Wong, I think the Senate order. Senator McKenzie. On a point of order of direct relevance, uh, Madam President, I asked the Minister about Perth and specifically the comments by the Labor Premier about the government's decision about Qatar uh, Airways. Thank you, uh, Senator McKenzie. The Minister is being relevant. Minister Wong, please continue. Uh, I make two points. One is, yes, Qatar Airways could fly bigger planes into Sydney, <laughs> Melbourne, <laughs> Perth and Brisbane. Uh, and other Fair airlines Birmingham. have also added capacity. Cathay Pacific, Singapore Airlines and China Southern have all announced, announced new fights. Uh, so I would make the point... I would Order. make the point... Order. Would you like? Order. Senator Cash, it applies to you. Minister Wong, please continue. Uh, 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 Minister, please resume your seat. <laughs> Senator McKenzie, you've asked the question. You raised the point of order. I've called the minister to her feet again. I've called the Senate to order several times. And the minute the minister stand, you interject. Minister, please continue. Uh, I was asked about the Premier's quote, and the Premier's. Uh, Senator Hughes, points of order also include you. Minister, please continue. I was asked about competition, and in addition to the points I've made about Cathay Pacific, Singapore Airlines, and China Southern. Uh, I would make the point that obviously these are national interest uh, arrangements between government, uh, and I would make the point in relation to competition. It isn't a free for all, and there's no better person to talk about that than former Minister McCormack, who said today, uh, sorry, who said on August 29, when I became DPM and Transport Minister in February 2018, I made a decision to put on hold um, an application Minister by Qatar Wong. Airways. I'm unsurprised Senator you Wong. want to interrupt the truth. Senator Wong. I'm unsurprised. Senator Wong, please resume your seat. Order. Order. Uh, Senator McKenzie. On direct relevance again, Madam President, this minister has not gone near Premier Cook's comments, has not gone near standing up for Western Australians and the uh, additional Senator flights McKenzie, they seek. You've made your point of order. You've asked about the government's decision uh, in relation to 
Qatar Airlines as it relates to Perth. I believe the minister is being relevant. I will continue to listen. Um, the question is being answered. Um, minister Wong. Uh, I was asked about a quote which referenced competition, and that's what I'm talking about. And I'm also talking about your colleague, the member for Riverina, who introduced a safeguards article to the Australian Qatar Air Services Agreement, uh, where he talked about it, uh, where he was concerned about undercutting other operators or abuse of market power. This updated deal was only finalised in Minister. 2022. The time for we agree with has that expired. principle. Senator McKenzie, first supplementary. Thank you. The Minister for Transport and a number of ministers in the Albanese government have said that the decision to block Qatar Airways' application for additional flights into Australia was made in the national interest. Can this minister outline what exactly the national interest grounds were for this decision? Thank you, Senator Mackenzie. Minister Wong. Uh, well, the, the first point I'd make is uh, that the minister has made publicly made clear publicly uh, that uh, first she is the decision maker and that she considers a range of factors when determining whether an expansion of bilateral air rights is in our national interest, and that's consistent Order. with what Minister Order. McCormack said today. He said you can't have an airline coming in from overseas. Uh, I'm Minister unsurprised Wong. you want to shut me Order. down on this, Mr. Senator Minister Birmingham. Wong. I'm unsurprised you're embarrassed Senator by Wong, this. Senator Wong, please resume your seat. Order. Order. Senator Birmingham. President, point of order on direct relevance, and this goes to the very issue and the heart of government accountability here. The minister was asked specifically to define what the grounds were that were in the national interest, not to go and quote past decisions or former ministers, but this government's decisions and how they have determined the grounds and where they are in the national interest, and she should be drawn to that very specific uh, question asked by Senator thank McKenzie. You. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. I will remind the Minister of Senator McKenzie's first supplementary. Thank and, you, and, Minister. And my Wong. answer uh, is the one I gave, which is the Minister considers a range of factors when determining whether an expansion of bilateral air rights is in our national interest. And that is not Order. unusual. It is not unusual for a national interest test uh, in legislation, Order. and there are, there, are, there, are, there are discretionary powers in legislation uh, across Senator government. Scar. Order. The question has been asked. The minister is responding. Minister Wong. Uh, it's not unusual for there to be a discretion uh, in a ministerial decision. It's not unusual for national interest to be the reference point in that decision, and it's not unusual for a range of factors to be uh, taken into account. Thank you, Minister. Account. The time for answering has expired. Senator Scar, order. Senator Mackenzie, second supplementary. It's very frustrating, Senator Scar. The CEO of Flight Centre said on Wednesday, and I quote, I think it's the most ridiculous decision I've ever seen. This is a significant blow. No other part of the tourism and aviation sector can rationalise it. Former ACCC chairman Rod Sims also said, if there was a time to allow new entrants in, this is it. Minister, if all our major airlines except one and Labor states competition experts and tourism industries are say let them fly, who is the government really protecting Thank when it you, says Senator this decision McKenzie, was in the, time the national for interest? Has expired. Minister Wong. Well, well I'm asked about, I'm asked about um, the rational undertaking. Order. I'm asked about uh, the, the reasons. Uh, why a government would make this decision. And I might refer again to the very experienced former Transport Minister, Minister McCormack, who, who gave a, a rationale which I think might be instructive for Senator Mackenzie. You can't have an airline coming in from overseas Order. and just undercutting to the point where Australian jobs are at risk and Australian airlines are placed at a disadvantage. You can't have an airline with very deep pockets, undercut, undercut Order. and undercut. Then people go to them as opposed uh, to an airline Wong. that may... Senator Wong, please resume your seat. Senator McKenzie. Point of order on direct relevance, Madam President. Who is this government protecting uh, when it claims Senator the McKenzie, decision was in the national Senator interest? Senator McKenzie, just go clearly to the point of order. I will remind the minister of the question. Minister Wong. I, I am surprised. I am surp Senator Birmingham. Order, please, minister. Senator Birmingham, I've just called you to order. 
Minister Wong. I, I am surprised by the disrespect that those opposite hold for Mr. McCormack. Uh, I, I would have thought that you know he's actually he actually has been a transport minister, uh, and his comments today in the Australian perhaps is a reminder to his party and his coalition Thank friends you, Minister. about the, the real world has in which expired. these. Senator Wong, resume your seat. Uh, Senator Hanson Young. Madam, uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Environment Minister, Senator Wong. Last week, the Environment Minister, Tanya Plibersek, approved yet another coal mine. This year alone, the Minister has approved five coal mines that create up to 150 million tonnes of pollution and emissions. Our environment laws are clearly broken. They do not enforce the Minister to consider the climate impacts. Under these laws, how many more coal mines will the Environment Minister approve? Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Minister Wong. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and I thank the Senator for her question. Uh, I, sh I am assuming this is an approval under the EPBC Act, uh, which wasn't indicated in the question, but I just will make that assumption. Uh, I understand um, the, the statistics I have is that uh, in the state of play in relation to coal projects is approved three, cancelled three, sent, uh, three. Uh, there are a range of uh, obviously renewables approved uh, 11 projects and 104 in the EPBC approval system. I'm, I reckon that's Senator Still. <laughs> I know that. I know that, Rick. We, we've been friends a long time. <laughs> I'll take the interjection. Um, uh, uh, Senator, uh, but I would make the point, and I appreciate you have a different view. The, the legislation uh, that the Parliament has passed provides Minister Plibersek with a discretion. There you go. Uh, uh, within the, the statutory framework, uh, and any decision the Minister makes uh, is a decision uh, that is consistent uh, with the legislation uh, that is before her. Uh, I appreciate uh, that the uh, Greens political party have a particular view about uh, resources projects, uh, and um, yeah, that's their view. Uh, the government recognises uh, that uh, resources are an important part of the Australian economy, and we also recognise that the transition uh, to renewables uh, is something uh, that has to be given effect and implemented with. Uh, important and clear policy decisions domestically as well as internationally. Uh, unlike uh, some, we don't have the uh, ability to magically simply call for something and assume that energy markets uh, will, will transform overnight. That's the hard work that we are doing, and that's what Minister Bowen is engaged Thank you, Minister. Senator Hanson Young, first supplementary. Uh, thank you. Eighteen years ago on this very day, the 5th of September 2005, Anthony Albanese MP, before he was Prime Minister, introduced a bill to fix the environment laws, a climate trigger bill, because he knew that our environment laws were broken. Climate crisis has gotten worse. When will this Prime Minister dust off his old bill and introduce a climate trigger? Thank you, uh, Senator Hanson. Young Minister Wong. Uh, what I would say is, you know, 2000, what was the date? 2005. Well, there you go. You know, it was. It, we are. There'd be people who get to vote today who uh, were only born at that time, and, and I would uh, say that what we. Senator Rustin. I don't need Order. to filibuster. You interrupt us, and I see you don't get many questions. As far we don't have to do anything. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, Agon, you just had a go at me, Senator and you, Wong, when I I'll respond, take you that's back personal. To the question. Uh, oh, right, okay. Senator so Wong, when you're order, saying that it's fine, order. when I'm doing it, it's Minister, personal. That's an interesting double Senator standard. Wong, please resume your seat. Senator Hanson Young. Order uh, on my left. Just a point of order, uh, Chair. The clock has been running, and I, you know, I. I understand that uh, Senator Wong is being distracted over here, but I'd like the uh, the question to the answer to my question. When uh, will this government introduce a climate trigger? Uh, Senator Hanson Young, I did uh, call the minister back to the question. I'm happy for the clock to re reset. 
Uh, Senator Hanson Young, uh, I, I, the point I was making before the interjection uh, is that uh, this is some time ago, uh, and the Prime Minister, of, uh, obviously, in 2005 was, res 2005 was responding to the circumstances uh, as he assessed them then, as uh, in his role then. The, we have made the same assessment now. Uh, and that has resulted in the policy that we took to the election, with very substantial reductions, uh, very ambitious reductions in Australia's emissions uh, between now and 2030, as well as a net zero uh, commitment, uh, and the policies that will transition the Australian economy. Uh, unlike the Greens, and I appreciate you have a different view, we actually have to do the hard yards of implementing that. And we are an emissions intensive economy. Uh, and changing our economic base, our economic structure in the way that this implies is a tough thing to do. It's also the right thing to do uh, for the future, for future jobs uh, and Thank the you, sorts Minister. of jobs the that will, will thrive in an next year. Senator Hanson Young, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Minister, does the government believe that environmental approval should consider the climate impacts on the environment? Uh, thank you. Senator Hanson Young, Minister Wong. Uh, the, the government uh, is of the view that, uh, the, these, that, the matter, that climate change uh, is you know, the challenge of our generation, and the government is of the view that the best way to deal with uh, our response to that uh, is through the, the policy framework that I have outlined earlier. So that has been the approach that the government has taken, uh, and that is the approach that we took to the Australian people, uh, where we laid out a very ambitious plan to reduce emissions, to increase renewables, uh, and to transition not our economy. And I'd make this point: this is not just for the reasons of the imperative of climate change; it's also for the imperative of future jobs. Uh, the vast majority of the global economy has moved to net zero uh, by 2050. Uh, what that means. Uh, is that to thrive in the decades ahead, our children and grandchildren uh, will have to work in industries which have, are of value in Thank that Thank you, Minister. Economy. The time for answering has expired. Senator Grogan. Thank you, President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Wong. Can the Minister please remind the Senate just how and why the proposal for the voice to parliament was developed? And in addition, why it will improve the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and how it will save money and make our country stronger. Thank you, Senator Grogan. Minister Wong. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Uh, and I thank Senator Grogan for her question. On October 14, every Australian will have a once in a generation chance to bring our country together. Bring our country together and to change it for the better to vote for recognition and listening so we Order. can get better results. You see, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians want the same things for their children as, all, as everyone else does. Help, they want them to be healthy. They want them to do well at school. They want them to get a good job. They want them to have their, the, the best opportunities they can. And that is what we are all saying yes to. The call for the voice did not come from politicians in this chamber. It came directly from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people after years of work and discussions across the country. Nearly 250, nearly 250 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, leaders and elders, leaders and elders Order. endorsed the Uluru Statement from the Heart in 2017, and it says we invite you. We invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. This is a modern, uh, modest ask of recognition of this land's first peoples Order. in a constitution through a voice to the parliament, a voice to help to achieve Hughes. practical progress in health, education, employment and housing to make sure governments make better decisions, uh, spend money wisely. And all this is needed because of the challenges facing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. A life expectancy eight years shorter the non-Indigenous Australians, children twice, almost twice as likely to die before their first birthday, a suicide rate twice as high, a suicide rate twice as high and fewer opportunities for education and training. Now, governments of both political persuasions with good intentions have spent billions trying to deal with these issues, but we have not, received, we have not achieved lasting uh, improvement. Thank you, Minister. The voice the is the chance to fix this. Has expired.
Uh, Senator Grogan, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister. There's some alarming facts in there that we should all be deeply mindful of. Can the minister please explain to the Senate why this referendum is on constitutional recognition through a voice to parliament rather than just recognition alone? Thank you, Senator Grogan. Minister Wong. The ask from the overwhelming majority of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people is for a referendum for constitutional recognition through a voice to parliament. Through a voice to parliament. Now, now Mr Dutton is out there talking about his referendum. He's out there saying he supports a referendum, just not this referendum. Do you support a referendum? He supports a referendum, just not this referendum. He supports a voice, but just not this voice. It's really clear, yet again, we see Peter Dutton, Mr Dutton playing political games because his political strategy, tried and true, he tries to build himself up by tearing everything else down. Uh, Minister, tearing please everything resume else your seat. Down. Minister Wong, please resume your seat. Order on my left. Minister Wong, please continue. That's why he says no to everything, even when it is a once-in-a-generation opportunity to bring our country together and change it to the better, for the better, even when he knows this closes the door on better outcomes uh, for Aboriginal you, and Torres Strait Senator Islander Grogan, people. Senator Grogan, second supplementary. I thank the minister for uh, that Senator response. Senator Grogan, please resume your seat. Senator Hughes. I have called the chamber to order. I had a senator asking a question, and the loudest voice in the chamber was yours. Uh, senator Grogan, please begin the question again. Uh, I thank the minister. Uh, that really has cleared it up for me. I thought I was a bit mad thinking that there was a proposal for a different referendum that order. agreed with recognition but didn't agree with listening to anything that that recognition would give you. So thank you for that. Can the minister please inform the Senate how consultation has guided uh, the proposal Grogan, for the voice and why Grogan. that is so... Order. Order. Senator Grogan, please continue. I'll just refresh there. Uh, can the minister please inform the Senate how consultation has guided the proposal for the voice and why that is so important? Thank you, Thank Senator you. Grogan. Minister Wong. Uh, the idea of constitutional recognition through a voice began with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people themselves. But it's clear that Mr Dutton isn't listening to Order. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, and if he, uh, we'd invite him uh, to speak to you know, people like Sean Gordon, the Liberals for Yes spokesperson, who recently said for politicians to go out and propose something alternate to what Indigenous people ask for speaks to our disempowerment as Indigenous people. But it isn't surprising that Mr Dutton didn't consult uh, the overwhelming majority of First Nations people. In fact, it doesn't appear that Order. Mr Dutton is even Order. consulting his colleagues. It doesn't appear that Mr Dutton is even consulting his colleagues. I mean, Mr Pitt said today that no referendum proposal, no proposal for another referendum, referendum has been put to the party room. Uh, and Senator oh. Nampajimpa Price and Mr Littleproud are not prepared to confirm, are not prepared to say uh, they were not Thank you, Minister. The so time the question is, has who expired. is Mr. Uh, thank you, Minister. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, President. My, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister uh, for the Environment and Water, Minister Wong. The mighty Murrumbidgee River flows through the ACT and it has been in poor condition for decades. It's been starved of flows and even stopped flowing during the, during the 2019 drought. The government has recently struck a deal with states to extend the delivery of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, including the 450 gigalitres of water for the environment. Order. But the Senate, Murrumbidgee uh, and other Mike, Alpine Senator rivers... Senator Pocock, please resume your seat. Senator Davey, I'm calling you to order. Senator Pocock has the right to ask his question in silence. Senator Pocock. Thanks, President. Uh, but the Murrumbidgee and other Alpine rivers are excluded from Murray-Darling Basin reforms. Will the government consider reviewing the Snowy Hydro operations as an option to contribute water to the upper Murrumbidgee and improve water management in the broader southern Murray-Darling Basin. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister Wong. 
Um, the, first, uh, Senator Pocock, you're right about the uh, effect of drought on the Murrumbidgee, and I was the water minister during the Millennium Drought, uh, and that was my fault. <laughs> God, I assume that was a joke, Senator Rustin. <laughs> Um, uh, and uh, that was a very stressful period for uh, Canberrans, uh, uh, given the risk to uh, the water supply for the ACT uh, at the time. And uh, that and the risk to Adelaide uh, was one of the reasons why critical human needs was given priority in the legislation uh, and in the, uh, the water uh, in the Murray-Darling uh, Basin uh, plan. Uh, because obviously the first priority does have to be critical human needs. Uh, in relation to, so, so the broader point uh, is, I think the question goes to uh, uh, the Snowy Hydro and the um, effect of that project uh, and how that project will be managed. Um, what I would, make, I would say is that we remain committed to delivering the Murray-Darling Basin Plan that, in a way that achieves the best possible social and economic outcomes for basin industries. Uh, the, it is the case uh, that the growing impact of climate change will exacerbate the challenge of manage, sustainably managing water resources, uh, and we uh, recognise the interconnection between, of water use between energy, agriculture and the environment. The advice I have as the government is willing to consider all options for improving the ACT's water resource availability, including the operations of the Snowy Scheme, we are committed to ensuring that the operations of the Snowy Scheme address both energy and water priorities, including for the ACT. I also understand that recently the minister I'm representing, Minister Plibersek, announced new, the new agreement uh, between the ACT, New South Wales, South Thank Australia, you, Queensland, the welcomed by the ACT. Expired. Expired. Senator Pocock, first supplementary. Thank you, President, and, and thank you, Minister. Um, how is the government considering water security issues in the Upper Murrumbidgee and other alpine rivers to ensure the ACT and sur surrounding regional towns can have access to critical human water? needs in dry times, as you outlined. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister, Minister Wong. Uh, look, that's a level of detail which I might ask um, perhaps Minister Plibersek uh, to provide you with further uh, information about that. Uh, obviously, uh, yeah, water plans, water management is, uh, is a very complex area of regulation, as you, as you may know, with uh, both federal uh, and, uh, in this state, uh, territory or, or local, as well as uh, operator-specific um, um, uh, plans of operating uh, in terms of the Snowy Hydro. Uh, but uh, as, a matter of, as a matter of principle, uh, the Water Act recognises the primacy of critical human needs, and as I explained, the, part of the historical context of that uh, was the water scarcity uh, experienced by uh, particularly Adelaide uh, and Canberra uh, and uh, operating the snow in a way that recognises uh, energy and water priorities is something expired. that... Senator Pocock, second supplementary. Mr President, and, and thank you, Minister. I will uh, look forward to answers from uh, Minister Plibersek. Uh, the rules that govern the Upper Murrumbidgee River and other alpine rivers were agreed to more than 20 years ago and have not been reviewed since. And these sit, sit outside the basin reforms. Uh, will the government commit to act to achieve better water management and adequate flows into the Upper Murrumbidgee? Thank you, Senator Pocock. Minister Wong. Uh, water rules uh, have always been uh, one of the uh, reform challenges in water policy because, as you correctly identify, uh, uh, we have different jurisdictions uh, with different arrangements for water. Uh, uh, some capacity by federal government uh, through the Murray-Darling Basin Plan to implement those water rules. But historically, water was managed, uh, including in a legislative and regulatory sense, uh, by jurisdictions. Now, part of the reform process that was undertaken post uh, Mr Turnbull and then mine and then Mr Burke's uh, uh, roles as water minister was to try and improve uh, water rules. Uh, for example, and I know uh, the National Party don't agree with this, you can't have, we couldn't have water trading uh, between, uh, catch, between uh, uh, parts of the river uh, without uh, changing water rules. And obviously, 
uh, with different patterns we needed to. In relation to the Murrumbidgee, I am not aware about Thank where you, Minister. that process is up to. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has advice. expired. Senator Babette. Thank you, President. Now, my question is to the Minister who represents the Prime Minister, Minister Wong. Now, Minister, a recent report by the Centre for Public Integrity revealed that the former Morrison government, this mob over here, honoured an appallingly low rate of just 48.7 per cent of Senate order for production of document requests. How terrible. Now, does the Minister believe that the former Morrison government was a transparent government? Because I don't think they were. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Minister Wong. Well, order. Order. Uh, thank you, Senator Cash. Uh, I don't, I don't believe anybody from uh, uh, any fair-minded person looking at Mr Morrison's secret ministries uh, or, frankly, the robo-debt uh, tragedy, tra tragedy, the, the robo-debt tragedy, um, would, would, would think that the standards of transparency and accountability to the parliament uh, were sufficient. I would make the point, Senator Babette, because I'm going to anticipate where your next question is. That as a consequence of uh, there being Order. an agreement or a decision to remove motions from the Senate order of business, uh, the ways in which the crossbench and the, opposite, the now opposition have sought to change that is by a very substantial increase in the order of production of documents. And Senator Babette, I am, I am someone who has been here for quite a long time, 2002. Uh, and I have never seen as many OPDs used as, is, just as indiscriminately as the current opposition and crossbench are using them. Now, it, that, is, that is fine if you—, uh, you So my, my point is, Order. because we have changed uh, one part of the program, uh, uh, beca uh, you know, because, frankly, uh, we, it was being uh, utilised— Utilised in a way that the Senate uh, had not envisaged, we are now seeing. Was it 10 today? In terms of OPDs, now, uh, if it, uh, if they, if those opposite and those on the crossbench wish to use OPDs in that way, that way, so be it. Uh, we will provide the information we are able to, uh, and obviously, information we are not able to uh, will not be Senator provided. Hughes. But again, I go back to. Senator Babette, I, I would have thought that uh, we, we remember what Mr Morrison was like and we remember the lack of accountability to Parliament, even to his own Cabinet colleagues when he took their jobs. Thank you, Minister. Them. The time for answering has expired. Senator Babette, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Obviously, you knew where I was going with that, not your first rodeo. So, obviously, my next question is, you guys, your government, you're at 20.4%. 20.4 per cent, twice as secretive as the former government, twice as secretive as Scott Morrison's government. Why? Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, Minister Wong? Well, the interesting stat also is that since in, in this parliament we've seen uh, nearly a doubling of OPDs moved per day and an increase in the number, 50 per cent in the increase. Order. And the increase in the number of OPDs were uh, agreed to per day compared to the 46th Parliament. Uh, but uh, uh, I will certainly, uh, I will certainly look at, I will certainly look at the. Senator Birmingham, may I remind you? Just this finished. is Senator Babette's question. He has the right for the answer to be given in silence. Uh, Minister Wong, have you finished? Or... No, you no not at all. Please continue. Um, Sen Senator Babette, I, 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 I will have a look. We will have a look at um, what is being sought. One of the pra if people were, if there was. Order. Order. Minister, please continue. Uh, if, if there are senators who want certain information, the, the approach I would always, uh, will I, uh, you know, would seek to take, would be to offer a briefing if available. Thank you, uh, Minister. Well, the time for answering oh, has expired. Thank you, Minister. Senator Wong, please resume your seat. Order. 
Uh, I'm waiting for silence be before I call Senator Babette. Senator Babette, second supplementary. Thank you, President, and thank you, Minister, for uh, your response there. I appreciate it. Now, given the lack of transparency that we've seen, unfortunately, from both sides of this chamber, uh, will you guarantee to the Australian people that all individual submissions for the draft Miss and Dis Info Bill will be uploaded for public view and that none will be censored because you know, I, I'm not seeing much transparency from anyone in this place for the Australian people so far? Thank you. Uh, Senator Babette, I, I have cautioned you before about the need for questions, particularly second supplementaries, to relate to your primary question. The, the minister informs me that she is willing to answer the question, so I'll call the minister. Uh, Senator Hughes, your rules. constant interjections are incredibly disrespectful. Minister Wong. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, President. Uh, Senator Babette, uh, I don't agree with the use of the word censoring. Uh, that's a very loaded word, and I think in this context I, I, I don't think it's opposite. Uh, in relation to what occurs with submissions before committees, those are decisions appropriately made by the committee. So obviously parliamentary privilege uh, and the, it accrues to matters before Senate committee or applies to matters before Senate committees, Senate committees will routinely uh, uh, make decisions about how it ha they handle uh, submissions before them, including the extent to which they, they are made public, which ones are made public, if all are made public, <coughs> and if there is material which is prejudicial or defamatory. Um, we don't, you know, we don't allow. We, the Senate seeks to not allow parliamentary privilege to be abused, and so there is redaction or Thank publication. Thank you, Minister. The time uh, for answering um, has expired. Committee. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Madam President. My question is for the Minister for Agriculture. Until last year, Australia was one of the last remaining countries to be free of varroa destructomite, a bug that has already devastated bee colonies in Europe. The United States and New Zealand. It's now more than a year since the varroa mite was first detected in Newcastle and is still on the move. In my state of Tasmania, honey, bee products and pollination services are worth approximately $20 million per year, and this does not include bees' immense value to agriculture. Yesterday we learned it has now reached new parts of New South Wales near the Victorian border, leaving Victorian beekeepers stranded inside the 25 kilometre exclusion zone. Is the minister still confident that enough is being done to stop the spread of the rural mite? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, Senator Lambie, and thank you for your interest in what is a really important topic, uh, not just of concern to beekeepers uh, and the honeybee industry, but also to horticulture uh, and pollination industries in particular. Um, you're right, Senator Lambie, that varroa mite was first detected in the port of Newcastle in June last year. Uh, and we've been working very closely with the New South Wales government ever since to try to contain this and bring it under control and, in fact, eradicate varroa mite because of the danger that they uh, present. Um, we do take this as a very serious biosecurity outbreak that needs to be eradicated. Uh, and as recently as this morning, I actually spoke again with my department, the biosecurity section, uh, to get a late, the latest update on where they are at in their negotiations with New South Wales, because we are providing them whatever assistance we possibly can provide, including dollars, uh, to help to eradicate varroa mite. Uh, I'm certainly aware of the evolving situation we face in New South Wales, particularly the recent detections of varroa mite in Kempsey. And the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries has been following up on a number of tracing links out of this area. As you're probably aware, Senator Lambie, uh, the federal government's primary role in relation to biosecurity is to keep things out of the country. If they do unfortunately make their way in, as seems to have occurred in this case, it is primarily the responsibility of state and territory governments to manage those outbreaks, but of course with our assistance, and that's what we're doing. Uh, there's also an investigation underway as to how a variety might got into Australia in the first place, uh, and that is obviously something that we're leading the work on, given our responsibilities around borders. But I very much share your concern, Senator Lambie, and I've seen the damage that it's already inflicted on beekeepers and the pollination industries, and we'll keep working as hard as we possibly can with New South Wales to eradicate it. Thank you, Minister. Senator Lambie, first supplementary. 
Thank you. This potentially catastrophic, catastrophic migration of royal mite is happening at the peak of our pollination season, with bees being trucked across the country, while small operators are in limbo with their businesses devastated. Is the minister being pressured by big mainland commercial producers to manage varroa mite instead of eradicating it? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Watt. Um, Senator Lambie, the short, an short answer is no. I certainly haven't been uh, put under any pressure whatsoever from anyone to do anything other than attempt to eradicate varroa mite, and that's certainly the focus that we have. Um, the, uh, I am concerned uh, that this, this, the varroa mite has continued to spread. Fortunately, it hasn't spread at this point in time beyond New South Wales borders, but we need to keep it that way and we need to help New South Wales to eradicate it from within its borders as well. Um, but no, absolutely not have I been placed under any pressure. And the only discussions I've had with the honeybee industry in general have been very positive and have been directed towards how we can work together to eradicate varroa mite and how we can compensate those beekeepers who have suffered losses as a result of the eradication of their hives. But again, Senator Lambie, I'm very committed to doing what we can to work with the New South Wales government to eradicate varroa mite uh, and happy you, to provide Minister. you with the any time further for briefings. answering has expired. Senator Lambie, second supplementary. Thank you. In July last year, Minister, you said that you were seeking to remove varroa mite from our shores. Last week on ABC South East New South Wales, you confirmed that eradication is focus. So does the Minister seriously still believe he can pull out a magic wand and eradicate the varroa mite from Australia? Thank you, Senator Lambie. Minister Watt. Um, well, again, Senator Lambie, as I've already said, the primary responsibility for managing and controlling biosecurity outbreaks when they occur in Australia lies with state and territory governments. Uh, we do support them in that and we're providing substantial funding to do so. So it's not a matter of me having a magic wand or me having a solution. It's about what the New South Wales government can do with our support and we're working very closely with them to do so. Um, there, uh, there may come a point in the future where uh, it proves that varroa mite cannot be eradicated, but we are not at that point and we are doing everything we possibly can with the New South Wales government to eradicate it. Uh, that is absolutely our preference. Uh, and as I say, as recently to, as today, I confirmed with our department that that is our intention. Um, so meetings are ongoing with the New South Wales government about what more we can do uh, to, to adjust their program, adjust their plan to eradicate varroa mite, and that remains our intention. Thank you, Minister. Senator Sheldon. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Senator Watt. Last year's Secure Jobs Better Pay reforms were passed to get wages moving again for Australian workers and reinvigorate Australia's Order. enterprise bargaining system. Despite wages increasing, worker wages and conditions are still being undermined by some employers who rely on loopholes within the Fair Work Act. What are the loopholes that some employers are using to undercut worker pay and conditions? And how is the Albanese government acting to close those loopholes? Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Minister Watt. Thank you, uh, Senator Sheldon. Now, I want to recognise your long career, uh, along with many uh, members on this side of the chamber, in fighting for workers' rights and fighting to close loopholes that see people being ripped off at work. Uh, and it's good that we now have a government in Australia that is taking these issues seriously. And Senator Sheldon, I have good news for Australia. I'm pleased to say that wages are moving again in Australia and employers are back at the bargaining Order. table thanks to the Albanese government's uh, Secure Watt, Jobs Minister Better Pay Watt, reforms. Please resume your seat. Order. Minister, please continue. They really don't like the idea of workers getting a fair go, do they? they if, there's, if there's anything they hate more, I'm yet to find it. Uh, as I said, their happy place is cutting workers' wages and, and stopping Order. legislation to fix it, and that's where we're back to. Senator Sheldon, Senator as I say, the Albanese government promised to fight for workers' wages and we are delivering. Here's what we've already delivered in just 15 months. An 8.6 per cent increase for the national minimum wage this year, the largest increase on record. A 15 per cent increase for aged care workers, aged care workers who the former government refused to do anything about. 
the gender pay gap is at an historic low of 13 per cent, and wages growth uh, has improved, increasing by 3.6 per cent over the year to June 2023 and 3.7 per cent over the year to March 2023. And the opposition have moaned and bleated every step of the way, just as they continue to do, to do today. But the reality is that loopholes do remain within the Fair Work Act that undermine worker pay and conditions. If a worker steals from an employer, it is a crime, as it should be. But if an employer deliberately steals from their worker, in most places in Australia it is not a crime. So the Albanese government is acting to close this loophole by criminalising wage theft. We are also ensuring labour hire workers are paid at least what they would be paid if they would be employed directly. We are empowering the Fair Work Commission to set minimum standards for employee, work, uh, employee like workers in the economy. We are about closing you, loopholes Senator and Watt, the opposition the time should support has expired. us. Senator Sheldon, first supplementary. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Minister Watt. Um, look, I travel for a lot for work, as many of us do, but I've also got to know the staff. I never forget having two long serving Quantas staff members. Maybe you want to listen to this. Two Quantas staff members breaking down in tears because they'd been told they can reapply for their same job at a lower rate of pay with labour hire or lose their job. What impact do these existing loopholes uh, have Senator Sheldon, on workers? Senator Sheldon, resume your seat. Order on my left. Senator Sheldon, please continue. So, what impact do these existing loopholes have on workers' wages uh, thank you, and job security? Time for answering that has expired, Minister Watt. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Sheldon. And we know over the last couple of weeks we've had a whole lot of Johnny Come Latelys who've all of a sudden decided to take an interest in Qantas. But there are some people, like Senator Sheldon, Senator White, Senator Stirl, and others, who have a long career in standing up for the workers of Qantas to make sure that they're treated fairly. Not Johnny Come Latelys, people who've actually got a record in standing up on these issues. And these loopholes Order. that Senator Sheldon Order. is complaining about impact Australians every day, and they create a race to the bottom on wages. Order. They undermine negotiated paying conditions and undermine the integrity of the enterprise bargaining system. The uh, loopholes Minister White, allowing... please resume your seat. Order. Once again, Senator Henderson. Minister, please continue. Good president. So rude. So consistently rude. These loopholes, which allow wage theft... Uh, Minister, Wong, uh, Minister White, please resume your seat. Order on my right. Order. Order. Senator Henderson. Just on indulgence, President, just to clarify, that was not me in that last interjection. But I, I want to say, uh, Senator Henderson. Sen Senator Henderson, I am happy I to, want to read. Correct the please record, take, please. Please. Thank order. you. Order. Order. Senator Henderson, I'm quite happy to review the tape, but I'm firmly of the view you were being disorderly, along with a number of other senators. But your voice was the loudest, and I heard you distinctly say to the minister. You talked about workers at Qantas, but I am more than happy to review the tape, but you were being disorderly. Minister Watt, please continue. Uh, Minister Watt, please resume. Senator Henderson, you are not in a debate with me. I've spent most of question time calling you to order, and once again I'm calling you to order. Minister Watt, please continue. Thank you, President. The loophole Senator Sheldon is talking about, allowing wage theft, insecure work and low wages, uh, which those opposite let fester for a decade, undermine the job security of workers, and they undermine employers who do the right thing. The Albanese government will not Senator allow Hughes. Australia to become a country where you have to rely on tips to survive, and the opposition should back us. Uh, Senator Sheldon, second supplementary. Thank you for the insight. It's good to see someone sticking up for Qantas workers on this side, not on that side. Uh, Senator Sheldon. Last year, those opposite just saw the Order. title of secure Order. jobs better. Order. Order. Senator Sheldon, in the interest of a respectful chamber, I would ask you simply to ask a question. Thank you, President. Last year, those opposites saw the title of Secure Jobs, Better Pay and knew they were against it. Again, this year, they are seeing the title of Closing Loopholes and knew, and knew guess what? And they are against that too. So what was the former coalition government's legacy on closing loopholes that have continued to undermine worker pay Thank and you, conditions? Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Uh, Minister Watt. Minister Watt. 
Thank you, President. Very good question, Senator Sheldon. Well, last year we heard claims from Senator Cash that the Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill would, quote, potentially close down Australia. Senator Looks Cash. pretty open. Senator Looks pretty Cash. open to me. Not closed down. And on the 4th of September, before the Secure Jobs Better Pay Bill had even been written, Senator Cash claimed Order. that our government's reforms would, and I quote, have the potential to take us back to the dark Senator ages Cash. to close down parts of the economy. You know, they'll be having leeches out doing medical treatment next to like they did in the dark ages. We'll be having nights of the round table in Senator Cash's world. Whenever Order. Labor does something to get wages moving again, you can rely on the catastrophizing and hyperbole from Senator Cash and the opposition. The former government had almost a decade to take action to close these loopholes, and instead we had Mr Fletcher calling the Labor hire loophole essentially a made-up issue. Low wage uh, work was deliberate design for you. Thank you. Order, Minister Wong. Much as I'd like to move an extension, I ask that.